Oh, hello everyone. Isn't today a beautiful day? The air is fresh, the sun is at its zenith, and since I currently find myself on this fictional Italian island, I couldn't help but reminisce about a simpler time, the good old days, so to speak, a time where warfare were fought on gut splitting, trench searing, skull crushing battlefields. What, in contrast to today? Peace, Bush, don't believe the propaganda. We all know how the real modern day wars are waged. It is online, on PCs or cellular devices, where men and women single-handedly control platoons of anthropomorphic vehicles and weapons that refuse to obey the laws of physics. In my meditation on how our gachalicious action resulted in us having such demonstrably superior ways of war, I um realized that this could have only happened because of the Third Reich. Company of Heroes 3 is therefore today's topic, a game published by an old ass company, by a developer that makes old ass games for old ass people. Hmm. My niece told me that me turning 28 this year would, by 1940 standards, make me an old ass veteran. And judging from the records back then, um, that smart cookie had me at checkmate. But back on topic, uh. 3 is a squad based RTS focused in World War II. A war so ridiculous that Britain's 80 long tons dummy thick tank was made obsolete Trash. because of speed. Germany's angry moustache model made the Japanese as honorary Aryans for acknowledging his dojin art. A Frenchman recruited Mr. Krabs to fight the Axis powers. And despite the key roles in the war, no one ever talks about the North African campaign. So what I'm trying to say here is that a lot of people got screwed. And while I know that my rambling may sound insane, everything I say thus far is 100% historically accurate. A British assault engineer squad can take down an entire regiment of German soldiers with just the use of a couple of flamethrowers. One of my infantry members throwing a grenade at the enemy forces will decimate a whole squad. That same soldier shooting a bazooka round at a lone infantryman misses three whole times. With not even the shrapnel from the blast radius dealing significant can damage. God bless the carbine. A sniper would pick up a whole squad while munching on some Wiener Schnitzel, lest you have an engineer that will take him out by taking down the whole building. Tanks, as usual, are the bane of everyone's existence. When facing them, you should either run, hide, or better, carry an anti-tank weapon. Story We have to start in 1922, when Benito Swagolini rose to power, wanting to pursue an illustrious, yet not so realistic goal of reviving the Holy Roman Empire. Recognizing that the country's industrial capacities and military were pretty mid, that is, in comparison to the likes of England and France, Benito took his chance in 1940 and sought to invade Northern Africa by blocking trade routes like the Suez Canal to stick it up to the Brits. Well, gentlemen, ladies, that was a pretty fucking dumb idea. Given the significantly harsh environment of the desert landscape, I would know, I have families from up there. The tactical genius relayed to his officer in command to um, attack the British forces to his front, yep, and that's all he said, Bruh. resulted in absolute failure. No. For real, it was so bad that most historians will agree that Germany defended Italy better than Italy defended Italy. Apologies for the sidetrack. The point is that you, gaming historians, are here to ensure that history repeats itself. By playing through the traditionally story-driven campaign in North Africa in some well-paced A scenarios that set you in command of the Roman Africa Corps in some 1941 marquee battles, devastating Muslims and especially Jewish communities in horrifying fashion. Why are they cheering? They're literally being invaded right now. In contrast, the Italian campaign sends you in command of three possible companies. The US Special Forces, the Airborne Company, or the UK Indian Artillery. Because these are the Allied Forces, throughout the campaign you will effectively get to try all of them out, as each and all have one common goal, to retake Italy from its Nazi fascisto occupation. However, whereas Company of Heroes sets the series apart with its focus on squad tactics and Company of Heroes 2 incorporated weather effects, Company of Heroes 3, perhaps under the guidance of the overlord for the so-called Undivided Chaos, better known as Sega, introduced a turn-based overworld map in its Italian campaign one that is very reminiscent to the likes of Creative Assembly's Total War series, thus giving players a map of Italy, asking them to move units around capturing cities, ports, 
airfields and other strategic placements, and when they occasionally bump into each other, kicking off skirmishes, special missions, or historical battles, like the siege of the monastery of Monte Cassino. Dude, this is what I would like to call a goddamn Sisyphean task. I can't believe that they went through something like this. How are they supposed to maneuver up the hills? Italy's D-Day of January 28, 1944 at Enzio Come on ladies, we have to hurry up, we need to finish this episode of Saving Private Ricardo Where the Germans had a fucking railgun What? <coughs> Sorry, railway gun Suddenly I imagine Italy receiving the Wolfenstein treatment with advanced tech and Jewish space lasers Both campaigns are enjoyable in their own way, but the lack of or should I rather say, the bad juxtaposition of how one affects the other really takes away from what would otherwise be a really good story. Gameplay You fight enemies for territory. The better you perform, the more income and experience you get, which in turn can be spent on units or upgrades. The objective of your skirmishes may vary from capturing and holding key position for points in like the deadliest form of Quidditch ever, to destroying the enemy HQ in the most spectacular way possible. Like the movie Kingsman taught me, and definitely not my parents, uh, manners maketh man, and with regards to RTS, infantry maketh the whole freaking game. These comes in squad of 4 to 6, with each individual members capable of being capped by a well placed bullet. Also, being that the genre has the worst strategy set as last, you, and by that I mean me, might be quick to forget about positioning. For example, taking cover in a crater left behind by the silly terraforming attempt of a British bombing round is kind of smart. But a giant rock, a brick wall, a poor Italian family's humble abode, literally anything else is definitely better. There's also the addition of the second dimension known as up, meaning that with even more elevation, more maneuverability is required of you. The Italian maps especially emphasizes gaining the high ground over your enemies, while alternating combat in between open fields, steep mountainsides or tight urban environments. The flip side to this cool new thing is that it also creates obstacles. A pretty clear obstacle to your often as young as 14 years old soldier is literacy, more specifically the definition of the word dynamic, where a set of conveniently placed oil barrel can turn the environment and the men's around it into mints. Artillery shells that on flat out kill the target will cause the rubble to do so instead. And of course, most combat vehicles, from artillery fire, tanks and planes, can cause more than emotional damage. This means that unlike what goes on in the year of our Cyberlord 2042, the 40s prior to this knew what a revolution actually looked like. Let's talk then about the real fun, which is found within the vehicles. Generally speaking, every steel container's effectiveness or lack thereof is determined by their ability to decimate or protect the human host. This of course depends on the size, plating, caliber, angle of fire and which shamanic spirits possesses the individual vehicle. Let's start with the Urukai. They possess some of the best tanks in the game, some of which are the Churchills, more specifically the MK4 and his tougher older brother, the Black Prince. Not caring for the possibility of the tanks getting stuck in the ground while passing a bump, the Orcs gave these bad boys some long ass turrets. Nobody in the comment section mentions the Sherman. Whilst the British forces themselves play pretty defensive, these terrifying Leviathans are anything but defensive. Also, much like the spirit animals, they too are chain smokers. There's also the Valentine tank, built by the Canadians and later owned by the Red Army. This one is blessed by Saint Valentine himself. With his greater armor and slight anti-tank gun, it insists on giving the enemy a kiss and does not take no for an answer. The Cocozoid Americanus They are rather slow in picking the pace. While they start battles with a squad that allows them to capture locations pretty quickly, it's only once you unlock tier 3 and the support center, i.e. add to the national depth counter, that they get the only thing that I care about. The Chad M8 Greyhound which in comparison to the virgin German Tiger II has a different dog in it. It has an armor thick enough to withstand 50 cal machine gun fire and the way that it crosses around the battlefield and shoots down enemy infantry will, like Jesse Owens, make the Germans eat your dust. It's the only tank that I've ever had the pleasure to ride on, so cut me some slag. The Wehrmacht 
<clears throat> this faction has met a lot of criticism from the fan base because, amongst many things, they do not come with fully voice acted German voices. So, as a form of respect to what little German that I've learned in high school and what some friends have taught me of German humor, I will slightly smile, put back my serious face on, and go on with the review. The Africa Corps. They are a mix between the Panzer Late from Company of Heroes 1 and the OKWs from K2. Since they have a bunch of engineer-based infantry, they can maintain your vehicles on the battlefield for much longer than most. The thing is that I'm not very tactically oriented, at least not when I lose. So when the opportunity arises, I like to spite my enemies by ordering a bunch of Katschutzen motorcycle teams and pursuing them and their infantry into their base. It's freaking hilarious and screw you if you don't find that funny. So let's finish this on this note. I've loved the campaign and I've enjoyed what I've got to play of the multiplayer. Yes, I did experience some bugs for sure, but nothing that was game breaking. Well, beside the weird technical wizardry of me yanking out my weaker graphics card out of my PC just to replace it with a better and far more powerful one, just to see it perform worse. I, I don't understand what happened there. But I can only speak of my experience with the game and it has been pretty stellar so far. My hope is that it gets further support and has a similar shift in perspective just like the sequel did. And also uh, some goddamn mods. Anyway folks, thanks for watching, more game reviews to come and uh, have a chill day.